Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, MAPE's Tools for Estimating and Project Managing. Just a little bit of light housekeeping before we start. Your phones are on mute. If you have any questions, please type them into the box in the corner of your screen, and we'll answer them at the end of our session, time permitting, or via email after. And you can always submit questions at any time to MAPE Digital at MAPE.com. Now, without any further delays, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Michael DeMello. He's a technical services regional representative with MAPE and has worked in the tile and flooring industry since 1995. He started his career in California as a tile installer, where the jobs he worked on included high-end custom homes and large commercial projects. He's a certified tile installer and a CTI testing evaluator through the Ceramic Tile Education Foundation, a certified International Concrete Repair Institute concrete moisture testing technician, and he's also a very valued MAPE Technical Institute presenter. Michael is currently working on his LEED Green Associate Accreditation through the Green Business Certification, Inc. Mike? The floor is yours. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike DeMell. I'm with the MAPE Texas team. And I've been with MAPE on years this coming November. And uh, as part of my introduction, I just kind of wanted to share a quick story with you uh, about how I ended up uh, getting onto the MAPE Technical Services team. I actually had a large project that I was managing, and, and I only know this story because I think it's relevant to what we're going to be going over. I had a large job down in Tucson, Arizona. It was the Pinal County Court Building, and uh, there was a ton of epoxy grout on this particular project. <clears throat> and needless to say, my guys didn't do the best of a job installing the epoxy grout. So I had drought haze all over the place. Uh, they got grout on some finished flooring, some cabinetry and acrylic uh, shower surrounds and things like that. So what I did at that particular time, um, which, cost a, which cost a lot of money to fix and a lot of uh, time and effort. And at that time, I contacted my local uh, sales representative, Jennifer, here in Phoenix, and I asked her if she would uh, bring somebody in to kind of give my guys a training on how to uh, do epoxy grouts. So this guy named John Benvenuti came into town and uh, he did a great uh, presentation. And towards the end of his, uh, his training, he mentioned that, hey, I'm just covering this particular area. The guy who, uh, who was covering the Southwest moved to Deerfield Beach, Florida to the corporate offices to cover the current region. And we are actually looking for a technical representative in the Southwest region. So this light bulb kind of came on. And um, the next morning I was uh, on the MAPE website. I, I searched for the job and a couple months later, here I am on the MAPE technical services team. But it, uh, what ended up happening on that job and me utilizing that resource of Jennifer and MAPE to come in, not only help my guys uh, fix the job, but hey, it put me into a, a new career path as well. So anyway, that's just a quick little story. Um, today's objectives, uh, we're gonna go over uh, processes and operations. You know, different companies have different styles. We're gonna be going over some challenges. I'll be going over a few challenges that I had as examples. Um, we're gonna go over some industry organizations that could potentially help you in different situations. We're going to be going over some qualified labor uh, for um, trade educated employees. And towards the end, we're going to be getting into some MAPE web tools slash resources. So processes and operations. Um, here in my particular area, um, I worked for a standalone tile company when I first got to the Phoenix area. And there are not too many of those standalone tile companies anymore. It seems like the full-blown flooring companies have kind of taken over the marketplace, uh, especially in this particular area. And as I'm going out into the field, I'm noticing that a lot of 
um, a lot of the companies in my particular area have a sales team or a salesperson that goes out and helps maintain and create relationships. And then what they will do is they'll actually get the plans and specs, bring them back to the office, hand them off to an estimator. The estimator doing the takeoff, the salesperson goes back out, follows up on the project. And if they are indeed awarded the contract, they will bring that back to the project, a different person who's the project manager, and that person will manage the job all the way to the end of the project. Um, for myself, uh, over the years as an estimator project manager, I was all in one. I was that sales guy. I estimated my own projects and I and I managed my own projects. And what that kind of did for me is it uh, gave me a very close relationship with each and individual project, which I think was a benefit uh, in the long run. So if there was ever a breakdown between sales and estimating or estimating and project managing, it was all, all a breakdown about myself. So we're gonna go over some different challenges with the different uh, portions of uh, you know, the salesman, the estimator and the project manager. First is the sales, you know, again, the sales guy is out there to create and maintain relationships. And sometimes we have to do things that are a bit uncomfortable uh, on the sales side. Um, I was actually coaching a youth soccer team at one point in time. And one of the kids that was on my team, his dad was actually um, an owner of one of the largest construction companies here in the Phoenix metro area. And the kid finally moved on to a different coach. And at that time, I called Bill and I'm like, uh, hey, Bill, do you do you mind? Uh, can I call in a favor? Do you mind uh, setting up a, a meeting with maybe a couple of your project managers? I'd like to come in and give them my spiel and hopefully we can get some business rolling together. And Bill's like, sure, Mike, no problem. And I came in and what I found was a whole conference room with all his estimators and the whole project management team. And I got to um, uh, create a bunch of new relationships and we started doing a lot of work for this particular company, um, which turned out good. But again, the, the challenge is doing some of those things that are a bit uncomfortable. Um, the, the sales guy also needs to be engaging and relevant. And that can also be a challenge. You know, not every person that you meet in the business world is someone that you're going to necessarily get along with or click with. And what I used to try to do is I'd walk into somebody's office and, you know, I'd look at their photos and around their office. Is this guy a hunter? Is he a fisherman? Um, you know, is he a golf guy or is he a family man? And I would try and kind of be a little bit relatable uh, to that side of things without trying to. Uh, sound like a used car salesman. Um, another big challenge that I find that I found out is we can sell all day long. And there's been many times where I've busted my book sale and then I would take that project and I would give it to the guys in the field and they'd fall flat on their face. And at that point, I'd be either in a, a salvage mode for that relationship or that relationship would uh, be cut short. And the last thing here, bid results. I had this habit of, and it was mostly for time constraints, is I would try to bid about a million dollars worth of work every single month. And um, I would call for bid results over the phone. And, you know, a lot of times it's like, you know, hey, where did my number end? You know, oh, you know, hey, I gave it to this other company, blah, 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 blah. And uh, was there anything that I can do to, you know, you know, with my price to try and get this project. And all the while, my boss, John, uh, was standing in the doorway. And one of the best things I ever learned from this man was he said, you know what, Mike? Uh, when I got off the phone, he's like, you know what, Mike? Next time you call for bid results, don't call. I want you to go into their office and make them say no to your face. I guarantee you, you're going to leave with something. You may not leave with the project that you want, but you'll leave with a new set of plans or a lead on an upcoming project. And since I started implementing that, um, my numbers started to definitely show an increase. Very valuable piece of information that I was given on that side. So we have some estimating challenges. Um, I don't know how many times that uh, I've got a set of uh, construction documents where there was a total and complete lack of information. 
or I got specs that were um, boilerplate or very vague. Uh, another big challenge is, you know, come bid date, uh, you, you're ready to go turn in your bid and you get a call from the general contractor or construction management team. Hey, we got these addendums that just came in and a couple deltas and we need you to revise your number. It affects your scope. And you end up looking at the addendums and it's a, basically a rebid of the entire project. And at that point in time, you need to make a business decision as to whether it is worth it for you to drop everything you're doing for the day and go back into this thing and uh, rebid it. Um, there's a lot of times too where we run into specifications that have discontinued products uh, or there are times where we get asked to do add deductive alternate prices at the very end of the, you know, on bid day. You know, hey Mike, um, <clears throat> You know, these walls are going to eight foot. Can you give us a deduct to go to six foot and then to four foot and change the floor tile to this particular tile? And that seems to be where um, you're, you're in a hurry, you've got other things on your mind and mistakes are made that can ultimately affect your bottom line. We also have things like Davis-Bacon wages or uh, things like bidding off hours. You know, I live in the Phoenix area and if I know I'm bidding a project and I know this project's gonna be going in the summertime. And I know, and it's an exterior project, I know that I'm not gonna be able to perform this during the middle of the day when it's 115 degrees. So I'm gonna to have to either bid something for off hours or some shade covers and fans and things like that. So, but that doesn't necessarily mean that my competition is doing the same. So there's always that challenge of how much should I put in or you know, how much should I leave out? So project management challenges, um, definitely lack of qualified labor. Um, I did this particular job down in Tucson. It was an FBI uh, building. And let me tell you, um, working for the federal government in an FBI building, I had to do, I had to get like 15 or 20 guys federally background checked. And I think I went through about 30 or 40 guys um, before I got the 15 that I needed that can actually uh, pass the background check to be on site. So you could only imagine some of the things that I, I got back on some of these reports. And um, so again, definite labor issues there. We got scheduling issues, weekends and off hours. Um, I remember a time where I was doing a Target stores and I'd get four of them at a time. And you know they would shut down the Target store at 10 o'clock at night, we'd come in, get on the uh, terminators, they would blow out you know, thousands of square feet of VCT and carpet, and then put the whole store back together and reopen for the morning like we were never there. But you could only imagine with four jobs going on, you know, I could have 10 guys on one job, 20 on another, et cetera, et cetera. The phone calls that you would get at three, four o'clock in the morning. So it definitely made for some sleepless nights and some challenges there. Also, we end up with things like uh, missing parts. I don't know how many times I've got to an end of a project or towards the end and find out from my superintendent, hey, we're missing you know, 100 pieces of trim. And it just so happens that that particular trim is the one tile that's coming from Italy and it's eight to 12 weeks on the water. And here you are scrambling, calling every distributor that you know across the country, trying to fill uh, those last hundred pieces to get the job complete. Um, we also have things like GC relations, you know, trying to keep the, the contractor happy. You know, we want to be as accommodating as we can as a project manager, but sometimes, as you guys know out there, um, that those uh, general contractors and construction managers, they don't mind asking for the world. And ultimately, um, we try to make them as happy as we can without, without harming our own bottom line. So those, again, are just uh, several examples of project management challenges. Now, um, <clears throat> these are a few of the projects that I have done over the years and some of the challenges that I've gone through. And before I get into um, continually talking about things that I have done, um, the reason why I do that, I want to make it perfectly clear ahead of time, is 
that MAPE technical services team, I believe we have, uh, I think we're up to 12 guys out in the field scattered all about the country. And I don't know if this was done on purpose or if it just so happened to turn out that way, but all of us 12 guys have somewhat of a unique background. And the beauty of that is, is we have guys that come from different facets of the industry. So myself, I have installation and estimating project managing background. I've got guys that are a guy that has a concrete background. We've got guys from distribution. We've got a floor covering guy who, um, you know, was a carpet and resilient uh, specialist, you know, his whole life as an installer. Uh, we've got a guy down in Houston who is a wood flooring expert. So the point is, is we have this big team of guys in the technical services side of things. And if I get a phone call and I don't know the answer, I have uh, all these other guys that I could call on to get you that particular answer. All right, so this job up here on the left, the Musical Instrument Museum, this was done probably about 15 years ago and it was actually done with all MAPE products. And uh, one of the challenges that I had there is that it was a uh, fairly large format tile and it was marrying up to uh, sand and finish hardwood floor on these big sweeping radiuses. Well, the architect decided to depress the slab three quarters of an inch. And um, we and, and, and if you know anything about trying to depress the slab only three quarters of an inch, it's going to be super wavy. So we definitely had our challenges there. I wish I knew then what I know now about self-leveling underlayments and things like that. Excuse me while I take a drink of water. Um, the, this next job up here is uh, Optima. Actually, I'm, I'm told that this job is still ongoing and I got in on one of the first phases and how I got in on this particular project was, is um, the ceramic tile portion of it was already awarded to a different contractor and I was just bidding the carpet and the resilient in the, in the job. And they had a particular carpet tile um, that uh, that mill was protecting uh, a specific contractor in town. Well, I walked into the job trailer. I talked to the PM. I said, hey, let me check out this sample. And we got to talking. We hit it off. And I said, hey, do you mind if I borrow the sample? I think I might be able to get you something very similar and save some money. I took that sample, took it to another mill. They knocked it off and had it back to them within a week. And I got this carpet spec switched out and ended up with that contract. But again, these are just challenges that we have and uh, things that we have to do to overcome them if we want to get the work. Um, next one up here, Big League Dreams. I just thought that was a cool project. That was a Little League ballpark. Um, it was a replica of, I think it was uh, Yankee Stadium. They had the you know, California Angels and some other, I think they had Fenway Park in there as well. This down here was uh, Pens Penske's Auto Park in North Scottsdale. And that was a multi-million dollar auto dealership. Um, they split that up between a couple tile contractors. Uh, my company did the Porsche, the Audi, the BMW, a portion of the Roger Penske's museum. And uh, one of the challenges we had there in the BMW dealership, we had this agglomerate tile that uh, when they started up the cars, the condensation from the tailpipes was getting on the agglomerate and it was a black agglomerate and it was turning uh, the agglomerate white everywhere that condensation hit. So we definitely had some issues there. This one here was a Lower Buckeye Jail, it was one of the first projects, major big dollar projects that I ever bid. It was probably, you know, uh, I don't know, probably $350,000 project or so. And um, I thought I was gonna lose my butt on this thing. There was a ton of mud work on it and a ton of epoxy. And what really hurt me on this job were actually logistics. Um, with all that mud work, it was very spread apart from all these corners of the building and upstairs and downstairs. And I could only get the material on site uh, so close to the building. So a lot of this stuff had to be walked in by hand or by wheelbarrow. So you could only imagine some of the challenges that we had to deal with. So again, these are just some small examples of things that I've gone through. And again, just to reiterate, um, this is 
I tell you these things and share these stories with you so you know that you have uh, people in the MAPE organization that feel your pain. We understand where you're coming from. And what we, we may not be able to cure each and every one of these issues, even especially the ones that I have mentioned, but the goal here is, is to um, <clears throat> make other parts of your job easier so you can spend more time uh, dealing with the other parts of the job that we can't actually help you with, if that makes sense. So addressing challenges with industry organizations. Uh, we have the NTCA, the National Tile Contractors Association. Um, the NTCA uh, is a group run by contractors and they have developed uh, a publication for its members to help protect themselves. It's basically uh, a handbook. Uh, we're gonna get into that handbook just a, uh, briefly in the next slide. Uh, hopefully we're all familiar with the Tile Council of North America. You know, this is the go-to organization for industry standards, installation methods. Uh, but one of the most um, misunderstood by many, I would have to say, you know, out in my dealings, in the, the trainings that I do all over the country, um, it's, they don't particularly know how to use it a lot of the time. And again, misunderstood. And we have here also the CTEF. The CTEF is dedicated to raising the level of knowledge of the installer through education and certification programs. You know, this is going to help our, our labor end of things. And then we also have towards the end of the uh, presentation um, some, uh, some MAPE tools that could be uh, helpful for you. We have many avenues for education, you know, such as MTI workshops. Uh, online tools and videos, architectural solutions, mobile apps, calculators, all kinds of things that we're going to talk about. And again, this is just four of many industry organizations that MAPE um, is part of. We have members in, in, in many different organizations, and we're proud to support them uh, because we find value in these particular organizations and what they have to offer. So the NTCA, um, again, this is uh, the this is a run by um, contractors. These are your peers out there in the field. So they have that handbook with problems prevention and cures for grouts, thin thin bed installations, underlayments, and substrates. And those are just a couple of uh, items that they cover. Um, there are many more. Uh, items that they cover within that handbook that will actually give you a particular problem. A lot of the things that we see on a day-to-day -day basis and the prevention and also the cure for that. And it's and it's all done in, in columns. We're going to get to that in the next page. And they also have um, sample letters that you can get out to your general contractor construction management team to you know address industry standards or put them on notice. And on the NTCA also host a litany of workshops and trainings. You know, a couple of the workshops and trainings that they hold are, you know, gauged porcelain tile slash panel trainings. They do uh, uh, trainings on self-leveling underlayments. They have grouting seminars, you know, large format tile seminars, etc. The list goes on. You know, during our non-COVID times, um, you can actually go onto the NTCA website and see the dates and the cities where they're going to be next. They got a few guys out there in the field that, that drive around in these big NTCA vans, you know, loaded down with tools, and they do these uh, uh, trainings and workshops, typically at um, large distributors in, in the cities, you know, all across the United States. So if you've never been to an NTCA workshop, I highly suggest even you as an estimator project manager get to some of these and try and get some of your guys to them as well. <clears throat> so here on this page, um, we have a sample problems, prevention, and cure. And oops, excuse me. And this particular one that I have up here is related to curling slabs and different um, problems that we could see with concrete substrates. But 
a curling slab, for instance, we see this quite often. Um, and a curling slab is when a slab is more dry on the surface and it's more and it's holding moisture uh, towards the bottom of it. And um, this can be caused by several things or a combination of several different things. Um, excessive air movement over the across the top, a lack of a moisture barrier underneath the slab. Um, or uh, a lack of curing compound. And one of the cures that, that they mentioned over here on that right-hand column is to uh, potentially increase the steel in the slab. I know by the time we get there, uh, that's probably too late in the game. Um, having that moisture barrier underneath or damp curing the slab. But let's just say you're, you're on a project that's ongoing and they're pouring concrete in front of you and you see that problem on that first slab, you could bring that to the attention of the general contractor. Some of the other things that um, they mention here are, and that I'm gonna mention as well, are deviations in the concrete um, division versus the section nine division for uh, ceramic tile installation. Um, the concrete guys have a floor flatness rating or you better known as an FF rating. Now that doesn't always coincide with what we have on the um, ceramic tile uh, ANSI standards. You know, ANSI 108 states that we need an eighth of an inch and 10 feet of flatness, which is about a floor flatness of a 45 to 55 in the FF measurement. And a 45 to a 55 is considered to be extremely or very flat on, on the concrete side of things. Typically the average slab that we're looking at is probably around a 30 to a 35 and definitely um, a discrepancy there. One of the things that um, a lot of us are unaware of is when, is when the concrete guy actually tests his, his slab for flatness. They do it within 72 hours of actually pouring it when the forms are still adhered to the, to the side of the concrete. They're basically taking a one foot grid in each direction, taking measurements, running it through a calculator, and at the end of that calculation, it spits out an FF number. And again, that FF number um, it could be wildly different from our ANSI standards. One of the other things that a lot of people don't really understand is, is where do we typically see the concrete curling? On construction joints, control joints, uh, the termination of a slab, expansion joints, uh, you know, changes in material. And they don't measure, the concrete guys don't measure anything within two feet of any one of those joints or stops or penetrations. So it's kind of, um, I don't want to say unfair, but it doesn't give the tile person a good snapshot of what is actually really going on there. So again, this is a good tool. They also have, uh, you know, um, sample problems prevention and cure for disbonding mortars, you know, grout shading, and all sorts of other items that you that you can find on there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this here is a sample letters to the general contractor and construction manager. Uh, you could find several of these letters throughout the NTCA handbook. Uh, the one here I have on the left and is related to bonded concrete. And the second one is related to um, critical lighting. Now, you can see over here on the left that this is basically a canned letter and you could fill in the date, the general contractor's name and address and get specific with the job. And essentially what this letter is saying is your concrete slab does not meet the parameters of ANSI and Tile Council of North America or industry standards. And what we're doing here is we're giving you the option to fix it because we're not gonna put tile over it and accept responsibility for this slab that is out of whack. Or you can, you know, um, everyone hates that, that foul word or phrase change order, but in order for us to fix these extensive uh, problems, we need to be paid for those services. Look, on the estimating side of things, um, 
we we need to bid for the most part uh, planning for the best of things, even though we know that we're going to run into some problems. So yes, is there times where we put a little bit of money for little hiccups on the job? Absolutely, but we don't have all the money in the world to be pouring leveler over thousands of square feet of bad concrete. This particular letter on the right has to do with um, um, critical lighting. And I don't know how many times, you know, we've done a tile installation on say a feature wall or a toilet room. And um, what they'll do is they'll, the architect or designer wants this uh, decorative type lighting that gives dramatic features and and that's exactly what it will do. They'll plant that light right on top of the, the tile installation on the wall and shine it straight down. And what that does is it casts these shadows that become very long. And what it does is it makes your tile work look like you have a ton of lippage or a terrible installation. And what this letter is here for is to kind of, again, put that GC on notice saying, hey, um, before we tile this, we know that you have this lighting scenario. We're giving you the opportunity to rethink the design, or if you want to continue with this design, we're not going to be held liable for um, any of those long shadows that makes it look like we have a, a bad installation. And we'll get into uh, maybe some of that in a little bit later on in the PowerPoint on some of the first pages of the Tile Council North America handbook that go over things like critical lighting and the tolerances for lippage and things like that. So again, this NTCA tool is here to help you and for your protection. Uh, I highly recommend that if you're not already a member of the NTCA, get involved. All right, moving on to Tile Council of North America. Tile Council of North America handbook can be uh, a bit overwhelming and uh, it should not be read entirely like a book. Um, the only portion of the book or the handbook that should be read like a book would be the first 54 pages. Um, this is where you'll find things like service ratings and environmental classifications and all kinds of other good little nuggets. And towards the end, you're going to be, you're going to find uh, the appendix. And the appendix is good information on ISO standards, also has things like estimated weights for uh, different systems. Um, if you're not familiar with ISO, ISO is the International Standards Organization. And MAPE actually has the ISO standards on all of our technical data sheets and on all the bags of mortars and grouts that we, that we carry. And what ISO does is it gives uh, a good delineation between performance characteristics of different mortars. Years ago, um, you know, we, we do live in the United States and we use the ANSI standards. They're the American standards. And we were stuck with ANSI 118.4 for many years. And basically all that said was, is a, you know, for instance, for mortars, it was a polymer modified mortar. That could be for our entry level CARE 111 all the way on up to our Granny Rapid system which have wildly different prices and wildly different performance characteristics. And when ISO was introduced in the uh, in Tile Council of North America, um, it's my opinion that it probably put a little bit of pressure on ANSI. And since then, ANSI has kind of upped their game and put um, different classifications on their ISO standards. They, they, they now have uh, ANSI 118.15. And they're adding different uh, acronyms like F for fast setting, T for thixotropic, you know, a lot like mimicking the ISO standards. Um, one of the other cool things that we're going to do is we're going to um, show you quickly how to navigate the manual. Not a lot of people know how to navigate the manual. I'm going to take a quick drink real quick. All right, navigating the TCNA manual. So um, this is uh, a method locator. You have the one on the left is the method locator by number, and the one on the right is the method locator by application. So I'm sure all of you that are at your office 
if you're a project manager and estimator, you have your Tile Council of North America handbook right next to you or close to your desk. So if you wanted to, if you got your 2020 handbook, um, you can turn to page 456 and find this method locator. So for an example, let's say you have a spec on a particular job that's specifying method B421. I can go to this method locator and see that down on B421, that it's on page 250 for tile and 420 for stone. And I could easily turn that page and find it and find that it's a shower receptor with a bonded waterproof membrane. So if you're not familiar with all the uh, different methods, you can easily turn to it and find it right there. <clears throat> it's This is one of those little uh, hidden things, it seems like. I, I myself, when I was estimating project management, I had no clue that there was this method locator in the back of the book. I was one of those people that uh, if I got a method that I wasn't familiar with, if it wasn't your everyday standard thin set method, um, if it was something out of the ordinary, I'm thumbing through the book, looking and looking and looking page after page till I actually found the particular method. And this makes it so much easier. <clears throat> so this one on the right is the method locator by application. So let's just say I have a, an open spec or I'm part of a design build and let's just pick something. Let's just say I'm doing a ceiling uh, over backer board. I can go over here and find ceilings and soffits over backer board. And then it's going to give me a, a, a method and send me to the appropriate page, which would be page 266. So either which way, um, depending on the application, you can find it that way. Or if you already have the number, you have that at your hands. There, there are two pages right next to each other. Um, page at the end of the handbook there on page uh, 456. Now, getting into reading the first 54 like a book, um, I have this big diamond on here because uh, this is where you find all the little gems that help us out. Uh, these little gems are, are things like uh, substrate requirements. You know, we talked about the standards, eighth of an inch and 10 foot. Uh, different things like mortar coverage. You know, what are the requirements between interior and exterior mortar coverage? Uh, flatness, we talked about floor flatness um, and lippage. Uh, they also cover things like critical lighting, environmental exposure uh, applications. Uh, it goes over things like grout joint sizes, layouts, and patterns. So um, it also has a material sections guide in there for um, the different qualities of ceramic tile, uh, porcelain tile, quarry tile, um, grouts from cement to epoxy. So all these things that we may have questions about, a lot of times you can find those answers in the first 54 pages of that TCNA manual. It's a good tool for us. Now moving on, um, let's talk about the CTA, CTEF qualified labor. Uh, the CTEF stands for Ceramic Tile Education Foundation. Uh, the CTEF offers uh, training courses such as understanding installing ceramic tile. It has training courses for uh, mortar shower bases, waterproofing, fundamentals of thi uh, thin bed knowledge. Uh, it also offers um, uh, certification uh, trainings or, or testing, I should say. Um, one of the things um, that that uh, if you're a non-union shop, that I highly suggest that you get involved in is getting your guys uh, um, CTI tested. And it turns them into an industry recognized certified tile installer. And we'll go over some of the features and benefits of that in a little bit. They also offer advanced certification for tile installers. So after your guys pass their CTI exam, um, these are tests that they can continue to take, you know, for certifications on grouts, so LFT substrate preparation, uh, mortar beds for walls and floors. They also have one for gauge porcelain tile and panel uh, installations. A lot of good stuff there. So, um, 
this here picture is actually a picture of the hands-on CTI exam. And it may not look like much, um, but let me tell you, this is not an easy test. It's a nine hour um, hands-on test. <clears throat> and and um, we'll talk about that in a second. But prior to actually getting to the hands-on portion of it, uh, once your guys sign up, for the CTI exam, uh, the CTEF will send you a whole package and it's a, basically a study guide of industry standards. And you guys need to actually take an online test prior to doing the hands-on test. They have to pass it before taking the hands-on test. And it's an open book test, but let me tell you, there's a ton of information in that book. And, um, it's going to make sure that your guys, by the time they take that test, that they know all the outs of your industry standards that they're using on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so uh, you look at this uh, CTI module. Again, you may not think it's much, but it's graded on 75 industry points of interest. So it's covering... Um, things like, you know, you, one of those walls is a wet wall, one of them's a dry wall, uh, one of them has pitch on the top of it. Uh, we have a perimeter expansion joint. We have a uh, ceiling for um, vertical and change of planes. And that layout that you see, you know, is very particular on how they want it laid out. You know, and, it, and just by looking at this test doesn't mean just because you see this picture, doesn't mean that you're going to pass it. I believe this was a 14 by 14 tile. Some of the guys were testing with 8 by 8. Some of them were testing with a 12 by 12. So it's different for for each testing person. So you can't just go in there and copy the guy next to you. Um, so one of the benefits uh, of getting your guys certified is that you can now um, advertise that you have qualified labor recognized by the industry. Um, <clears throat> you can put that on your business cards. You can put that on your website. And what, in my opinion, what that does is it just puts you a cut above the next guy who can't say that all of his installers are certified tile installers by uh, industry standards. Um, well, another cool benefit is that your company name and the installer who actually got the certification will show up on the CTEF website. And, um, you know, I took this test, I don't know, I guess it was about a year and a half, two years ago. And um, I, there was, I think there was 13 people who tested. I was one of three or four that actually passed. Most of them didn't even finish in a lot of nine hour time frame that they give you to do the test. Um, so again, um, not easy. So you could be confident that your guys know their stuff by the time they're done with this certification training. Again, putting yourself a cut above the competition. Um, one of the things that, uh, uh, I do get periodically is I'll get a phone call on my mobile and it will say, Hey, we found the person will be like, Hey, we found your name on the CTF website. We Googled uh, certified tile installers. Can you come out and give us a bid to do this particular job? You know, obviously I work for my pay and I don't, and I don't go out and do those jobs. Um, but what I, what I like to do is say, I, I apologize. I work for a major manufacturer. What I can do is help you out with uh, um, getting the right um, system in place for your installation. And I'm going to refer you to the, the CTI that's closest to us. So we try and uh, recommend, if we can't do it ourselves, recommend them to another CTI. So here, um, the ACT, again, Advanced Certification for Tile Installers. Um, so some of these certifications are proficiency with ANSI 118.6 for grout. You know, that would be our standard cement grout, uh, 118.7 for high performance grout, and then ANSI 118.3 for water cleanable tile. 
and uh, grouting epoxy. And uh, also part of that grout ACT is proper placement of EJ171 movement joints uh, throughout the installation. Uh, an another thing about that is what they learn is not all sealants are created equally. I can't just go out to the local big box store and get a, a colored sealant and think I'm going to put it in the middle of the floor, you know, for a movement joint uh, because it, uh, not all of them meet the proper service ratings for that particular application. So again, these advanced certifications um, are, are definitely beneficial. And again, you could ensure that your guys are getting the proper knowledge that uh, they require for that particular installation. We also have ACT for a large format tile. This one uh, also has a written exam uh, prior to the hands-on test. It goes over proper substrate identification and preparation for LFT uh, um, for ANSI and TCNA standards. It goes over proper mortar selection and mixing, proper grout joint size determined by ANSI, TCNA, and the given tile manufacturer. Um, again, also goes over a placement of crack isolation membranes and movement joints. How much crack isolation should I be installing for the size tile that I'm putting in? Uh, that's another thing that, uh, again, you know, being part of the tech services department, I get to see a lot of job sites. And let me tell you, um, most of the time, I don't get a phone call from an installation company saying, hey, come out and check out my beautiful job. I did a fantastic one today. It's usually get called out to a job because there's some type of problem or issue. And I do see uh, more so than not an improper placement of crack isolation and movement joints all the time. <clears throat> they also have an ACT for mud floors and walls. Again, this one has a written examination on different methods, substrates for, for mud floors and walls. Proper placement for vapor barriers, proper placement for wire reinforcement, um, proper installations for bonded mortar beds. Uh, again, this is going to go over uh, ANSI standards for substrate flatness requirements for normal and uh, large format tiles. I think you guys get the point with uh, the CTEF and uh, the testing and all the things that they have to offer to up your game on the installation side of things. I think we've driven our point home there. Now, finally, I'm going to take a quick drink and we're going to get into Mape web tools and resources. So Mape has many different uh, web tools and resources. We have the Mape smartphone app. Um, we have uh, different material calculators. Uh, you go onto our main web page. We have architectural solutions that can be beneficial, uh, product systems and warranties. We have a section for health and environmental. And uh, we also have a section, you know, that the technical services team um, helps out with quite extensively. And that's our technical bulletins um, that we have written for different types of systems and substrate preparations and things like that. And then we also, lastly, have the MAPE Technical Institute. Um, the MAPE Technical Institute is run by obviously MAPE Technical Services Department. And we'll get into that here in a little bit as well. <clears throat> so first, let's talk about the MAPE uh, smartphone app. Um, when I was estimating, I used to keep one of those pocket-sized MAPE product catalogs next to my PC. You know, I always, um, it was just more handy for me because uh, back then we had the big three ring binder that was pretty bulky and big, but my local sales rep always, uh, you know, every year she'd come over and give me one of those little tiny booklets that was, was very convenient. But nowadays um, we have the smartphone app and, and I believe it was uh, about a month or two ago, <clears throat> MaPay actually launched our brand new app and uh, it has much more to offer than our older version. So if, if you have tried to go onto your app from your old version, more than likely it's not working. And hopefully you just didn't say, oh, maybe it's not working, forget about the MAPE app. 
actually delete that one, go to the app store and uh, search the Mape app again. And then the new one will come up on your Apple or Android device and get that. You can, from that particular app, you can access our 12 US product lines, technical data sheets, safety data sheets. You can also email them directly from the app. Um, we also added some video, a video library to help you get a better understanding of existing and new products and installation tips. Um, the calculators that we have on there are definitely much more comprehensive. Uh, a couple um, added benefits that I think uh, on the estimating project managing side that I think could be kind of cool. Um, basically, you can plug in the material you want, say it's the tile, the tile size, the thickness, uh, the area of, of the amount of tile that you're going to cover, the notch trowel size, and press enter and it's going to give you a bag count. This is how many bags of mortar that you're going to need for that particular um, installation, for example. And the added benefit or the, the added feature that I particularly like is now you can actually take your distributor cost and plug it onto the app and what that will do, and you push enter, and it's gonna generate a total cost for the total amount of bags that you ordered, and it will also break it down um, for a per square foot cost, which is pretty cool as well. You know, say, you know, we're, we're doing a, a change order or an ad or something like that, and you're on, the job, you're on the job site, you know, in the job trailer. You could pull that up real quick. If you know your profit and overhead in the top of your head, uh, you know, it's going to take you a day or two of labor, boom, then you have your, your estimate right there. You can kind of give the guy a verbal right on the spot. I think that's kind of cool. Uh, <clears throat> it also has the same features for items like adhesives, sealants, self-leveling underlayments, uh, a lot of our different products. Um, this would also be a great uh, help for your field personnel to have on their phone. Um, for instance, for an example, um, we have a job that has multiple buildings. You know, I don't know how many times that I've sent my driver out to a job and to meet with the superintendent and say, hey, we need to split this, uh, these pallets up into these different buildings. Well, we end up with 20 more than we need in this building and 10 less in this building and vice versa. So if your, your field guy actually had this on hand, he knows the square footage for that building, type it in real quick, take you a minute and a half, maybe tops, and then you know the exact bag count that goes into each building. Or they can communicate with that delivery guy and say, hey, uh, we need X amount of bags in building A, B, and C, and move on. I just think that's a super cool uh, feature. We also um, has that feature on there where to buy. Type in the zip code, and it'll give you all the local distribution in that area. All right, moving on to our, our web-based uh, solutions. So right here, we're gonna be talking about architectural solutions. On our MAPE webpage, you can hover over uh, the tools and downloads and select tools for architects. This will allow you to choose uh, a TCNA method and it's gonna basically generate uh, a layering system in spec form with all the MAPE materials or you also have the option of before you hit print to select which materials you want in that layering system. So uh, I believe this is method F103B. Um, again, this is, I like to use methods like B421, kind of misunderstood. F103B, I get a lot of phone calls on this particular method. And um, <clears throat> you'll see all these little lines are different portions of the layering system. And each layering system is listed down in here. And for instance, say grouts, we can list all the grouts, you know, Caracolor S, um, Flex Color CQ, let's say, Carapoxy, um, Ultra Color Plus FA. But if you have something that's specific, and you only want Ultra Color Plus FA, and you only want LFT mortar, and you only want Aqua Defense, and so on and so forth, you could print it out in that manner as well. Um, one of the benefits, you know, from the project management side that I see here is say you have a large project uh, with several different TCNA methods uh, specified on, on one single project. 
um, I'm going to use a gym as an example. You know, you got a bunch of uh, gang showers and they're going to be following, you know, a shower method. You've got a bunch of thin set method floors. You've got a pool that has to follow the different uh, um, pool tile section that's in the TCNA handbook. You got a commercial kitchen, let's say, that is a mud bed with epoxy. So it's not just one particular TCNA method for the whole entire project. The, the cool thing is, is you can plug all those materials for each one of those TCNA methods and uh, hand that in as part of your submittal package. You can put those, uh, this particular thing in your files for quick reference for future use or file them on your computer. One of the other cool things I, I would suggest um, that you could use them for is part of your uh, job work order. When you send this particular job, when it's ready to go active out into the field, and I have these different thin set mortars and mud beds and different droughts and different drought colors and so on and so forth. When I give that work order to my guys out in the field, now there's no confusion when I have just you know 15 pallets of, of material on site, they know they could look at that layering system for that particular method. Okay, this is for the kitchen. I'm using four to one mud bed. I'm using, you know, um, I'm using water stop for the, water, the secondary waterproof membrane. I'm using ultra color plus or pure epoxy IEG for the grout. And they'll be able to know rather than using the wrong material for the installation that they're doing for that day. Again, it's just a, a cool benefit. Um, we also have on the architectural solutions, architectural solutions um, it's called Spec Maestro, which is a tool you can utilize in the design phase of negotiator projects, let's say for an example. Um, uh, say you need some budget numbers, you can choose materials to specify and it will generate a section nine written specification to help the design phase or the architect. Um, basically what it will do is, is we're all familiar with looking at division nine specifications, right? So we know how it's laid out. Well, we have that option on spec maestro, but what we have the opportunity to do is plug all the particular MAPE products within that section nine category and then boom, we have this uh, specification generated for you know helping out on a, on, a, on a design build, let's say. Super cool feature for you guys. <clears throat> All right, moving on to product and system warranties. You know, MAPE offers several different warranties. We offer a one-year product warranty, a 10, a 25, and a lifetime system warranties. And you can find these also under the tools and downloads section on the website. And uh, if you don't know what a tile system is, you know, according to you know MAPE rules, is uh, a system uh, for tile and stone. Let's just say is at least two MAPE products um, used in conjunction with each other, and those could definitely qualify for a ten, a twenty-five, or a lifetime warranty. Now the difference between, uh, I get this question a lot, well we want to we want to use Ultraflex 1 and get a, a lifetime warranty. Excuse me while I take a drink. Um, that's probably not going to happen. So the difference between a 10, a 25, and a lifetime warranty are the products offered for that given warranty. Um, the longer the warranty, the more high-end and robust the products used will get you that longer warranty. <clears throat> the, the better warranty is also gonna cover uh, more things such as labor and finished products installed for the given area you know, of the defective material. And that's a key word there, defective material. Um, obviously warranties don't cover things like installation error you know if you're using products incorrectly that's really not a mape uh, a mape deficiency so what we're warranting is against uh, uh products that are you know we're, we're ensuring that our products are manufactured correctly and meeting the, the specifications and standards of our quality control 
Um, you can actually print these uh, warranties from our website and send them in to my pay. Or if you want a job specific uh, warranty, you can contact your local sales rep and they can get a job specific warranty generated for you. And you know, we typically have a pretty quick turnaround time. It's usually about a day or two for our product warranties. Now, moving on to uh, health and environmental. Just so you know, a quick little tidbit here in 2019, we were, or Mape was awarded the Green Step International Environmental Award for our company wide dedication to sustainable practices. So, for those of you uh, that are involved in any type of lead projects, you know, Mape definitely has the products and documentation to uh, contribute to that point system. Uh, we also have our EPDs or environmental product declarations listed here. You know, some of these are industry wide, you know, like our mortars and grouts that are held by the TCNA. And, um, but we also have um, product specific EPDs that we hold in house uh, for products like waterproofing and, and things like that. There's, there's many, many more than just the waterproofing. If you don't know what an EPD is, an EPD is uh, is basically a report on materials lifetime impact. It's a report on the materials lifetime impact on the environment. So that gives you a better understanding. Now you can also uh, get VOC content, the sustainability reports, and a lot of these you can find actually right under the um, if you search the product on the website. Um, if you look down below that page, on that page, you're going to find technical data sheets, safety data sheets, and a lot of these other reports as well. Uh, so our material ingredients tab will get you the information you need for products that uh, don't use red list ingredients. If you're not uh, sure what red list ingredients are, they're, uh, you know, harmful chemicals, uh, you know, one of the big ones that you're probably familiar with are things like lead and asbestos. And, um, you know, for, for further information on, you know, health and environmental questions, I highly suggest, uh, you know, it's not all the time that we deal with these on an every single day basis, but every now and then we do come across those projects that require that special attention. But I highly suggest you contact your local salesperson and they could put you in touch with our sustainability expert. Um, and uh, I hope if I say your name, um, it's not gonna get me in trouble, but Brittany uh, has done a, an awesome job with our sustainability side of things. And uh, she knows more than I'll ever know when it comes to this particular subject. So I highly recommend uh, if you have uh, in-depth questions, um, we get, get you in touch with the right person. All right, moving on to MAPE technical bulletins. You know, uh, MAPE has uh, many technical bulletins. Uh, you know, for an example, we, you know, we have things, uh, bulletins on porcelain tiles coated with wax. We have uh, seasonal temperatures and epoxy grout uh, technical bulletin, uh, uh, hot weather guides, uh, installing tile on balconies or decks. You know, that's one of my favorite ones. Again, uh, that's why I had that F-103 up on the TCNA because that's one of those ones that are um, a lot of the times done incorrectly. Um, and we're gonna talk about that right now. So technical bulletins. Um, you can also find these under tools and downloads. Um, Uh, a lot of the times these uh, technical bulletins, they're gonna cover, if you if you come up into here, they're gonna cover the general design, the types of substrates. Um, this particular one is installing tile on balconies and decks. And it's gonna explain the, the difference between primary and secondary waterproof membranes and the different TCNA methods associated with that type of installation. I believe there's, uh, I think there's three or four for exterior balconies and roof deck type applications. And they're the first ones, one of the first ones in actually in the Tile Council of North America handbook. Um, but the reason why I bring this one up in particular is, is because again, I do get a lot of calls on this particular method. 
And uh, typically the call goes something like this. Hey, Mike, um, do we, uh, we have this particular job and uh, can we do aqua defense right over the plywood roof deck and put LFT and our tile over the top? And the answer is no. You know, we have to follow this method. And again, it's that full blown layering system with the primary waterproofing, a leap layer to get water evacuated, reinforced mortar bed, uh, optional secondary waterproof membrane, thin set, grout, and tile. So again, um, it's very detailed. And again, this is just one of many of those subjects that we have to help you out with. And uh, what this will do is you can take this actually to that GC and say, hey, this is what the manufacturer is wanting to see to meet the warranty for this type of installation. You know, uh, a lot of times though, they don't build them with enough room to put that full layering system in there. So but we do have some, um, some alternatives that we can, we can go over, but I think we're running out of time and I better uh, try and wrap this thing up in you know, the next couple slides. But if you have more questions about that, be, feel free to ask. Someone will get back to you and answer that. Uh, reference guides, real quick. Um, these can also be found under uh, tools and downloads. Reference guides are, uh, are a bit more general than our technical bulletins. This one here is on surface prep for tile and stone. Uh, this can be used uh, as the manufacturer's backup for ANSI and TCNA prep guidelines. You know, for an example, if I have a floor out of tolerance or concrete that uh, has a sealer on it or it's non-absorptive, burnished or something like that, I can go to that general contractor with this and he's going to tell you, hey, well, my last tile guy had no problem with it. He went over this burnished concrete and, and concrete floor with a sealer. Well, we're not going to do that because that is not um, um, per industry standard. We want to give you a good installation. So it's not just you going there on your own two feet um, saying, hey, your floor is not good. Now you have the manufacturer backing you up, you have ANSI backing you up, and now you have TCNA backing you up. MAPE Technical Institute. <laughs> um, you know, under normal times, MAPE offers many classes throughout the year, you know, either at our plants, and we also have some special request locations. Uh, I think 2019, we did over 70 MTIs around the country. Um, one of the special locations we did was Seattle, Washington. So sometimes it makes more sense for us. Uh, at that particular one, we rented out a conference room at a country club on a golf course. Uh, we did our PowerPoint presentation inside and we did all of our hands-on training and um, product demonstrations outside underneath these uh, metal gazebos. And the country club had food catered in for us and it was uh, it worked out really well for us. So um, the MAPE Technical Institutes are not just for installers, uh, they're for installers, uh, distributors, but I also highly recommend that you estimators and project managers get get there because you know um, as you know the materials that we have out there today it's a lot like the electronics industry it's constantly evolving and the more you know about the new stuff coming out and the different uh, features and benefits of these particular products um, you could bid them accordingly and as a project manager get your guys out there familiarized with these particular products all right we're at the end so this is the summary. Hopefully uh, we're able to utilize industry standards to overcome job site related challenges. Uh, hopefully we're understanding how to navigate the TCNA manual. Uh, hopefully um, we're able to see the benefit in uh, industry organizations to gain and keep quality labor. And most of all, um, hopefully you guys will got something out of this to where you can utilize, you know, those MAPE resources uh, that I mentioned earlier. But with all of that, uh, thank you so much for spending your morning slash early afternoon with me and MAPE. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, as Mike said, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to send them to Mape Digital at mape.com, and we hope you'll join us again.
Have a great day.